Hi, welcome to my talk, Improve Your Automation and Reduce Toil. Um, I'm excited to be here. It's my first time at this event. Uh, I am Mandy Walls. I am a DevOps advocate at PagerDuty. If you'd like to get in touch with me, I am LNXCHK on Twitter, or you can email me. I'm mwalls at pagerduty.com. I'd love to hear from you if you have thoughts or questions or just want to chat. So I'm going to talk about automation. So I figured, well, start at the basics, right? So that we kind of are all in the same place, right? So what actually is automation? So we've all heard the word, you know, we kind of have maybe a nebulous idea of what it means for various kinds of industries, but what does it actually mean for, for us and technology, right? So we're going to take some kind of manual process, something that Someone in our team runs piece by piece, and we're gonna ask some kind of machine to do that work for us, right? And we're gonna be looking for tasks that machines are really good at, right? Because that's not everything, right? So we're looking for things that don't require a lot of nuance or creativity or lateral thinking, and we're gonna encode them so that the machine understands how to, to manage them, right? So we're not talking about machine learning and artificial intelligence and that kind of AI stuff right now. We're just gonna be focusing on uh, boring, plain old automation. So our humans then, once we've taken all that sort of stuff they already understand and given it to the machines, then our humans go off to do stuff that's more interesting and more valuable, right? So automation, is a key component in the management of all the complex real-time IT systems that we manage. The amount of information that you have to sort of process and take into account when you're making decisions or you're making changes, is super immense, right? You've got your microservices, you've got your cloud platforms, you've got third-party and internally developed services, and they all have their own idiosyncrasies and behaviors and weird things that they do for no reason, right? So there's just so much stuff that one person can't hope to know all of the things about all the things anymore. So to get work done and to do it right, teams rely on automation for their common tasks. Automation helps you avoid mistakes. It helps you increase your reliability and repeatability of your tasks. And it reduces toil in your day-to-day -day work. We use automation and build and test and deploying software all the time, right? We automate the creating and maintaining of infrastructure components. Anytime we have a task to perform and we need to do it more than once, or I have more than one person on my team that has to be able to do it, we should consider automating it so that it always works as expected. Our team members aren't automatons, right? So when we wanna make sure a process is always performed the exact same way, we automate it. Automation can take lots of different forms, right? It might be a library of scripts. It might be other tools. It might be YAML files, right? That are ingested into something else. It might be encoded in the configurations for your build server, right? You'd have to do that over and over again. There are things that collect your knowledge and all the expertise from everyone on your team and they store it in a place where everyone can make use of it, right? So everybody gets to make use of all this amassed knowledge that your team has. So what is toil? And I've used that word a couple of times. Uh, toil is a four letter word. Our teams want to do interesting things. They wanna do tasks that impact the bottom line, create value, require some kind of expertise and creativity. But what is toil? Toil in general is a kind of repetitive tactical work that increases linearly as the size of an environment increases. So think about things like deploying updates to software and systems, adding user or system accounts, scaling environments, testing backups, all those things that if I add one more machine or one more instance at the end of the, the pod, I'm gonna add that much more work. Even in our fully modern systems, the tasks of sort of regularly re rebuilding our short-lived environments and adding new versions can be toil, right? We know this work has to be done. It's like eating our vegetables. We have to do it. It doesn't particularly add value to the customer or the end user immediately, but leaving it neglected will definitely 
impact the user sooner or later. It might allow a security breach. It might cause degraded performance. It's this hygiene, right? It's like brushing your teeth. If you skip a day, well, we're all still working from home most of the time, so maybe okay, but don't tell your dentist. But if you quit brushing your teeth completely, like somebody's going to be pretty concerned about you, right? So yeah, have these things that you just kind of keep on keeping on with, right? <clears throat> the good thing about these tasks is while they need to be completed, we don't have to use our humans to do them. We can give them to the machines and make them automated. So let's look at the four drivers of automation. We're looking at things like complexity, speed, managing mistakes, and reducing toil. Manual processes in general are prone to mistakes. It's just plenty of opportunity for typos to cause havoc in our large environments. Anything from typing commands in the wrong terminal window, we've all sort of been there, to missing options off of one of those really long command strings, or skipping a step when you're copying commands out of a wiki or other documentation, it, it happens, right? Modern IT systems might be composed of hundreds or even thousands of individual components. Cloud infrastructure, like your containers and your hosts and your networks. Services for monitoring and collecting metrics. Alerting systems, like PagerDuty. Log collection, authentication, authorization, A-B testing, beta testing, storage, runtimes, blah, blah, blah. All these things, right? So the number of possible combinations is basically infinite. So when we have all these different components and all these things, they can all change at any time. Third-party services and resources get changed by their vendor on their own schedule. They don't care what you're doing on Thursday if they want to put a release out, right? So it requires you to keep up with all those things. It's hard to keep up with all the stuff that's changing and all the things that it's supposed to be doing, even for teams that are super conscientious about their documentation and their dependency mapping and all those things, right? My list of service instances might be outdated before I even finish it, especially if my environment uses auto scaling and other pieces of, of, of work there. Any work that I need to perform on the instances needs the most recent data. So it should probably be some kind of query <clears throat> to an API instead of a hard coded list. It's easy also to make mistakes when we're using manual processes. We talked about a couple of these, especially those with many steps or complex commands. One thing automation does for manual processes is allow your team to permanently record all their expertise. You're taking all the esoteric information folks have learned, that thing kind of wobbles in a weird way. This thing doesn't actually report the right return code, but it's okay. You know, all those weird things and lets you put them in a place where everybody gets to practice. So your team might have started with some documentation and a run book or a wiki or multiple steps that need to be copied and pieced into a terminal. Even that task can have multiple places where mistakes are possible when people are stressed or they're responding to a critical incident or they're just busy and distracted because like life, right? So they might copy things out of order or miss a step or not catch the whole command or pay something in the wrong terminal. Any number of things can go wrong. So we wanna protect them from that. And then finally, we automate to avoid toil, all that repetitive work we were just talking about. It needs to be done, but it's not particularly interesting and certainly not challenging. Patching hundreds of systems for a security fix or restarting services to incorporate a new configuration setting, granting access to new users. A team still has to know how to do these things in order to automate them. Someone has to understand them. But performing the same tasks over and over and over again isn't the best use of our time, right? So there's lots of fun cartoons about automation, especially from XKCD. There's always at least one, and I'll tell you there's two in this talk. But this one's kind of funny one. So thinking about some myths around automation, the first one is automating yourself out of a job. Is it possible? Maybe. But what you're really going to be doing is automating yourself into a new job and hopefully a better job, right? When your team has automated all the toil out of your everyday tasks, you're left with the work that provides or requires more creativity. It requires more long-term planning. It gives you more strategic value to the organization, right? Things like planning improvements. There's never enough time to do all that. Building a more robust disaster recovery plan. When was the last time you got a chance to look at that? Building and shipping more new features for your users, smoothing out the tasks required to get basic stuff done 
leaves more time for doing all the fun stuff. At some point, your day-to-day -day job will look significantly different from what it once was. Instead of running manual processes, you'll be maintaining and updating those processes periodically, performing more high-value tasks on a daily basis. A cartoon's a little tongue-in-cheek, right? You definitely don't want to be spending all of your time replotting, rethinking, refactoring, and continuing to spend all your time on your main on your automation. Um, but you know, hopefully, what you end up with it looks a little bit more like the top cartoon than the bottom one. And then there's another one here. You don't have to know anything if it's all automated. And this is an interesting idea around automation and things that are kind of scary for people. There is research in systems engineering and automation engineering that indicates having fully automated environments can hinder skill development for junior engineers or your new team members. To create really useful automation, someone on the team has to have had at some point really, really robust expertise in the systems and processes being automated. Your team won't be successful if no one knows what's really going on, even with automation. But automation is part of your life cycle. It's part of the life cycle of your applications and the systems that it's part of. It will need to change as the services change. It will probably need to be updated when the operating system or dependencies are updated, whether it's your runtime or your language becomes EOL or you're on that really, really old version of your platform and you need to bring stuff up to speed. Maintaining the automation tools for a service becomes part of maintaining that actual service so that it is ready for runtime. So learning how to maintain and test the automation, all of the run books, other tools that the services use is a key way to help your new team members learn about services. Does the start stop script need to be updated? Are logs now going to a different location? are updates being downloaded from a different artifact repository. They're key pieces, right, of the system information that you need to be able to use to maintain the scripts, to maintain the tools that run your systems. Not only will you need to know things, you'll have to be very, very good at them. So there is some interesting reading in that sort of field. Things from, especially the time between, uh, like after World War II into like the 70s and 80s from like nuclear engineering, and electrical power generation and those kinds of services where you think about there's a lot going on, there's a lot of telemetry, a lot of things that people can know about, but a lot of the stuff has to be automated. So there's some pretty interesting reading in, in that field. So let's talk a little bit about good automation. I stole this list from Architecting for Scale by Lee Acheson. So I the second edition of this book um, was published last year by O'Reilly. So there's a wide variety of tools and platforms available to help you automate your workflows. They're gonna be different depending on the operating system you're using maybe, and depending on your targets or the kinds of platforms you're, you're working on, but it's, it can be hard to know what works best, right? And what might work best in your environment. As a baseline, this list of requirements can help you choose tools that will help you automate and maintain the automation, right? Because it's a, a living thing that comes along with you. So it looks like kind of the same goals you'd apply to software development, right? Uh, whether you're writing the automation yourself or you're buying a tool, right, to help you automate, we can keep some of these in mind, right? So it wants, you want it to be testable. You want to be able to test your automation. It's going to be out there in your ecosystem, doing things on your behalf. So you need to make sure it's correct, right? Applying maybe test-driven development methods to your automation code will help you with this as well. So you want to think about that. And you might also, you know, think about relying on, you know, your test suite when you're making changes and upgrades so that you say, okay, here's the script to install my application on this version of the operating system. I have to do this update. It has to end up sort of the same on the next piece. We can run the tests to do that. Your automation, second one there, should be flexible. So you get value out of it over time. Don't rely on hard-coded system lists or other data. When you can add a database query, add an API query, add variables for version numbers and service names that will help you in the case of upgrades, right? When you are looking at putting your automation together, 
treat it as software, put it in version control, practice code reviews. That's going to help you maintain the automation over time. It's far better than having a directory full of script.sh underscore BAK type files for folks to wade through when they have questions. Use your code reviews along with your test suites, and that will help you manage assumptions and catch issues before they become production problems. Now, it's also going to help your new team members become familiar with all of your services and all the automation, right? And then you want to keep your automation for related systems the same. This can easily get out of hand. If your application teams aren't required to use the same runtimes or other tools, I totally understand. But anywhere that you can, reuse components. I, I know that if you're in a large organization, one BU and another BU, they've decided to buy the same, buy different products for the same solution, and then nobody can share anything, and you're duplicating all of that work, and it's, oh my gosh, so painful. Um, and that can be hard, absolutely. But when I have a wide scope of things that I want to apply my automation to, make sure you're making things so that you know, it's, it's uh, applicable to as many things as possible. Reuse your components, create official libraries, create official methods for dealing with the common components. Make these solutions the easiest way to get work done so that folks aren't tempted to like skirt around the rules or create something else. Finally, you want your repeatability and your auditability. We wanna know every time the tool runs, it's going to produce a predictable outcome. Some tools are far better at this than others and will provide easier tracking for who made a change or ran a command to help your auditors and your compliance officers and all those folks with those things. So keep an eye on that, right? When you're looking for tools, when you're looking to build your own stuff, keep these kinds of things in mind. Now I wanna diverge a little bit and get a little bit automation nerdy, right? We're gonna talk about idempotency. And I've also heard this pronounced idempotency. And I, that does not, I have to like sit and think about it, right? Idempotency kind of rolls off my tongue. If that's wrong, I apologize. So hopefully you've heard this term before, especially when you're thinking about automation and automation products. But if not, let's review. Idempotency has a fancy mathematical definition. It is the property of certain operations whereby, you know, it's fancy when they say whereby, they can be applied multiple times without changing the result beyond the initial application. It sounds confusing and potentially ominous, right? But it's super helpful for thinking about what happens when you run automation more than once and how to handle any messages that might get generated. What happens on your system when you wanna add a user, but that account's already present? What happens if you want to rotate logs, but they're already rotated? Does your log rotation just keep creating empty files? There was once upon a time a bug in a Linux distribution that actually did that. It was very frustrating. Uh, if you are installing a software package and it's already there, what happens? What if you are concatenating a new configuration line to the bottom of a file? Does it create a new file? Do you delete that file? Do you start over? Does it just keep adding more and more lines at the bottom because it doesn't know that it's there? For the tasks that you want to automate, you're not going to have that human there to read the output and say, oh, hey, stop, wait, this has already been done. You'll want to add some kind of check to your automation to determine if the change actually needs to be made in the first place. Or maybe another check to make sure that it was changed. You're inspecting that state and I don't want to do anything if it's already where I want it to be. So this is where your automation starts to get complex. You don't want your scripts to bomb out, return an error if the work that they are trying to do has already been accomplished, right? Things are the way you want them. So you want a successful run. Some system tools will already have some item potency built in. So they won't try and redo work that's already been done and they're not going to give you an error, but not everything, right? Other tools you'll want to verify. They might not redo the work, but they'll return that error code, which will give you a false negative and report back to your requester. If you're building your own tools using shell scripts, for example, you're going to want to build in some of that item potency yourself. So keep that in mind. It's kind of this squirrely term that, that sort of hangs out in automation land. So here's the second cartoon. Yay, XPCD. Uh, what should we automate? Automating the tasks that you do most often or those that take the most time will save you the most effort 
over the long term, right? As well as reducing your overall toil. Also, things that have the most complex or convoluted workflows, you might want to look at those so you reduce the chances of making a mistake. You also want to look at how comfortable people will be with having the process automated. There is definitely some stuff when you talk to people and you want to say, we want to automate this. I mean, like, eh, 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 not, not comfortable with that, right? So there's always a cartoon for these, right? Uh, maybe you've seen this one. This table represents how much time over the course of five years, right, you will save if you automate a given task based on how often you do it and how much time you shave off the process. So making small improvements in tasks that you do a lot will reap significant rewards, right? So that one's kind of fun. So when we think about that in the course of, you know, a specific kind of workflow. So in this example, we're looking at things I might do if I'm responding to an incident. I work at pager duty, incident response kind of what we do, right? So it gives us some example tasks that we could think about automating. And it puts them on two axes, looking at uh, the impact on, on the, the y-axis and the simple to sophisticate the complexity on the x-axis. So I made a list of you know, the tasks that you do while you are responding to an incident and triaging what's going on and, and resolving that. And then plot them on this xy to kind of get an idea of like where to start. The impact graph gives you, you know, how likely a task is to break something or have negative consequences in your production environment. Low impact things, they just gather information. They're kind of read only, right? They're not changing anything. They're fetching logs or doing a performance check or running top or, you know, one of those things. Tasks with a little bit of a higher impact are things like restarting a single resource, right? Or a single service um, or performing some kind of simple failover. Then the highest impact tasks change key pieces of your infrastructure, making a firewall change changing something in the database, rolling back or redeploying software. These tasks can often have a higher likelihood of causing a cascading effect, right? And having other customer impacting issues if they go wrong. Then looking at the other things that, that we might have here, right? The simplest to most complex, right? The simple restarts, our information gathering, all those things that are up against the, the left-hand side there. We know they're, they're pretty easy, they're pretty predictable. And then as we go on, we get to the things that are most sophisticated and maybe the most touchy, right? Multiple service restarts, capacity scaling that isn't done automatically or you know those kinds of things, right? So how comfortable your team is with any of these tasks being automated absolutely varies, right? You might actually have site rules in your organization about which of these things you can target for automation. You might have some services that are actually more complicated to restart, right, than, than most normal things. And you should maybe move those further to the right. You know, you might have like, you know, it, it might recompile code or it might put a lot of stuff into memory because it, it can't do a cold start. It has to do a warm start or whatever. Like those kinds of crazy things can happen. So you could plot this kind of chart for any number of your common tasks, right? looking at impact, look at complexity, and then start targeting the things that you know are low impact, low complexity, and start your automation there. And then over time, your automation is going to evolve, right? We can look at how that, that happens, right? As your team gets more comfortable with specific types of automation and you get better at creating it, the human interaction decreases and automation runs more on its own. So we have sort of a five-step process that we've kind of built out to sort of explain to people, you know, sort of where you are, right? So we call the first one automation opportunities. It's really a fancy way of saying things we haven't automated yet. What tasks exist in your environment that could be automated but haven't been done yet, right? That's where we get started. Then over time, we have human-initiated automation. That's our common scripts. It's other tools that team members can run on demand when they have, you know, something that needs to get done or they need to complete a task in an unscheduled manner, right? And it's just the, the stuff that we have there that, that helps them out. But it's human initiated. Human being logs into a server somewhere or initiates a, a call somehow. 
then we've got automation with oversight. And that's when automation starts running on its own in response to some kind of environmental trigger, right? This might be simple things like your cron jobs or rotate logs or more interesting things like restarting a service when it just stops responding to queries and something's watching that and says, that thing's been quiet for 30 seconds, let's boot it. This automation still requires some humans making sure it runs okay most of the time, right? So while it might start on its own, it might also send an alert to your team member to say, hey, I ran a thing, please make sure everything's okay, right? When we get to the automation with fallback stage, the automation runs and it only requires human intervention if something goes wrong. So like for our restart and service stopped responding, the automation kicks in after you know 30 seconds or whatever, and rather than saying, oh, it came back up and everything's good, the service doesn't return, then at that point we're calling the human beings, right? The automation might have its own escalation functionality, right? To let humans know, it might send a report to PagerDuty to escalate an incident there so that you know, right? But if all goes well, the automation probably doesn't report, right? You just don't need to necessarily know, at least not in real time, that it's done anything, right? Eventually, some of your stuff might get to monitor and evaluate phase. Tasks get done with automation, edge cases get managed, and instead of tasks creating tickets or alerts, they create metrics. Instead of saying, oh, Brian and April ran N requests to restart the service this week, you might have a new metric that says, we restarted that service and time this week by the automation. And Brian and April are overdoing useful work instead of restarting this service that needs to get fixed but hasn't yet. So in this phase, your team is gaining the most from the automation when the tasks are completely handled and can be managed really as a metric because you want to watch them. You don't want it to be, okay, well, last week there were only five and then this week there's 15. Like that's still something you want to know so you can catch it and reprioritize some work on it maybe, but you don't want your human beings involved in all of those restarts. So not all of your automation tasks end up reaching all of those phases. There's some stuff you're gonna be more comfortable leaving it with oversight or with fallback, or some stuff you might be so complex or so touchy that you're gonna leave it with human initiated, right? But the more tasks you can get sort of further to the right, the more time you're gonna save and the more uh, benefit your folks are gonna reap from that. So let's take a look at uh, run deck. So run deck is part of the PagerDuty family. It is an automation server that will help you, you know, put things together and keep all of your, all of your knowledge in run one place. So run deck is a software solution specifically built for automating your kind of run book based tasks, this production tasks, or uh, even non-production tasks, right? It's combined all of the knowledge that your team has and then shares it to everybody else. So when you combine it with PagerDuty, it gives you two big advantages. You get auto remediation of issues before they become incidents and you have an accessible tool for human responders during those incidents. So Rundeck provides a platform for your team really to securely perform their tasks or to delegate them to other teams. So you can apply automation to varying degrees, right, across all your different projects. So when we looked at, you know, these kinds of definitions, you can run any kinds of tasks with Rundeck across human initiated and fallback and, and all those kinds of things. So what we have is the folks on our team who are the subject matter experts, the folks who know all the things about all the things, they have their tools and the stuff that they've written for themselves. But, you know, it gets kind of annoying if people are always asking them to run these things all the time. So they can encapsulate them into what we call a run deck job, and then anybody can run them, right? I can delegate those tasks to other folks in my team. I can delegate them to developers or SREs or test uh, folks or help desk or contractors or even other software to be able to come in and say, hey, you know what, this service needs to be restarted. And then my subject matter experts don't have to get pinged about that anymore. So you've got your users and your organization. They want you to run a thing right now. It needs to get done, but you're busy. You've got other things that you're working on. So what they can do then is go to the Rundeck server and say, hey, run this job for me on these nodes. 
And the Rundex server has access to the nodes and the human beings do not. So the job gets run and the human beings don't have to have access to all of the things that are out there. So it helps you keep the human beings, their authorization kind of ends at that uh, fence on the Rundex server. And then the Rundex server has the authorization to go further into your production environments. So it's super helpful that way and sort of encapsulates all those things and keeps it uh, nice and separated. So here's what it ends up looking like. I, I can run things on node. I get a report back that says all my steps were okay. I might have uh, my own projects that I have encapsulated. And this is sort of my job view when I've run a task. So it tells me how long it ran, what nodes it ran on, and whether or not it succeeded. So all of this is then also available to my auditors and they can say, oh, well, you know, okay, so this user ran this thing at 5.13 PM. So we'll add that to our, our list of, of things that happened uh, if we're you know, running through some kind of event or something like that. And that's what that looks like here. I have a list of tasks that I've run. It tells me when I ran them. It tells me who on the Rundex server ran the things and the things that they ran. So one of the key benefits of automating these tasks is that you get all this built-in auditing, right? Platforms like Rundeck and other tools in its space include this activity log, right? So I don't have to write this activity log. I have to write down or post somewhere else that I ran the thing. It's actually recording it for me, right? So the admin view here gives me all these project executions and all that kind of stuff. So I'm gonna take a look at a different view here. We're gonna go over to my PagerDuty account and we're gonna take a look at how automation can help you with resolving incidents. So, um, or at least responding to incidents. So I have some services here, go to my service directory. And I have a couple of them that are hooked into my Rundex server. And then I also have my Rundex server here that has some example jobs in it. They're, they're named intuitively PagerDuty example. So I'm gonna fire off a couple of incidents here. And I'm just going to do that from a script. And we're going to take a look at my incidents field here. All right, so I have my incident. It tells me that the server is on fire. Who knows what's going on there? It could actually be on fire. You just don't know, right? So um, I'm here. I have my incident. I click into it. And one of the things I can do is I come to this more button here and I have set this up that I can fix it with Rundeck. I don't have to go to Rundeck in this case. I'm just gonna say, hey, you know what? This incident, I know on this service, I have a job in my Rundeck server that maybe it restarts the service. Maybe it cleans off some of the disk. Maybe it changes permissions on something that's kind of chronic or, or whatever. And you know that that's sort of the first step for trying to resolve this incident. It might not be the final solution and that's fine, right? But it's that first step and then I don't have to find my credentials and I have to do any of the other things. I'm still in pager duty and I'm just gonna let Rundeck take care of it. So watch there, don't blink, right? Cause it's actually just talking back to the API and saying, all right, well, I did this thing back here and, and now we're going to, it looks okay and we're gonna resolve it. So that gives me only one place that I have to go when there's something wrong, right? So I have my PagerDuty alert, it comes to my phone or my email or whatever. And I, you know, I'm looking at it there and I can just click on the button there and let Rundeck take care of it for me. Now, that's pretty quick, right? But we could be quicker if we know we're beyond that automation with human interaction part, right? If I know, that there's some incidents on this service. It's kind of, you know, this persistent issue. We haven't got the fix in yet. I don't want my folks being woken up in the morning or overnight to try and fix this thing over and over and over again. It'll eventually get fixed in the code, but for right now, let's just automate it. So let's do that. I have a different service here that I have hooked up. And we'll go to this one. Right, and we see my earlier services, uh, earlier incidents down here. And then I'm gonna fire one off. So take a look at our timestamps here. This last one was at 12.38 PM. And we're gonna do 
send an incident over. And I go to my incidents page. I don't see anything. But here's my new incident. Okay, so I'm going to back to the service so we can look at it there. All right, so here was this old one, 1238. Here's the new one, 611. It's already been resolved. So let's click into that incident because I didn't have to do anything to it. It didn't actually pop up in my incidents list because the action that's hooked in here, this event action, is automatic. It just does its thing. So I don't have to. So we look at the timeline and it says, all right, we triggered it. It notified me via my email. I do get the email on this particular case. So I'll delete that. And then the API runs. It acknowledges it. It tells me, hey, you know what? This incident is being worked on via run deck. So if it was like a longer running process or an update or something like that, then my responders come in and say, oh, run deck's got this. We'll just wait and, and see, make sure it's okay. And then it resolves it. So I didn't have to do anything with that. I fire off the incident. I wait for it to be resolved. So I've got that kind of ability between the hookup there between PagerDuty and Run Deck to take care of all that stuff for us. So um, there's lots of things that, that Run Deck will do for you. There's plenty of uh, um, plugins and all kinds of other things for uh, Linux and Windows and cloud platforms and, and all that great kind of stuff. So if you want to take a look at it, you can give us a shout. We'd love to share it with you um, and, and give you a, a tour there. So um, we'll go back to the last little bit of slides here. And I want to make sure, you know, if you do want to know more about Rundeck, give it a look there at rundeck.com. If you'd like to know more about PagerDuty, we're at pagerduty.com. We have a bunch of ops guides. One of them is about auto remediation. If you wanna like take some time and read through that and there's some good resources there with some actual white papers, if that's what you're into, you can give that a look. It's a pagerd.com slash ops guides. And the auto remediation one in particular is there at the bottom. We're also on Twitch now. Uh, we have two Twitch channels. We're a pagerduty and PD community on Twitch. We'd love to have you join us there. We are getting some run deck content going on those channels for you. And then we also do a bunch of stuff about the API and some other things. So we'd love to see you. We'd love to hear from you. Um, give us a shout anytime. I'm Mandy Walls. Like I said, LNXCHK on Twitter. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Um, bummed that we didn't all get to be together in Nashville, but maybe next year. So I uh, hope you have a really great rest of your conference.